Hey Eagle's Nest, it's that time of year. Tis the season to get ready for the season. And to that end, Pastor Jay would like to also share with us at the end today during his announcements, how we can give back to our community. Stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, Pastor Bob would like to conclude our Isaiah series with The Root and what exactly that means according to Isaiah's first scroll. But before that, worship. God bless.
from the ashes your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light lifting us up bearing our burdens healing our hearts to a God we lift up one voice to a God we up one song to our God we lift up one voice singing hallelujah to our God we lift up one voice to our God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one voice singing
in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, that verse gets preached, but sometimes we remove it from its context. And so what we've been doing is we've been giving you the context leading up to these scriptures. And this is a very important one that ultimately speaks about Jesus Christ. But it's in a context. There is something happening in and around these verses. And that's what we've been leading up to. And what we've been seeing is that because Israel and Judah, Israel was the northern kingdom and Judah was the southern kingdom. Israel had been divided in, through civil war and they were divided. And there's two kingdoms. Well, they, had, they were apostate. They were running from God. They weren't serving God. And God continued for 200 years to strive with both nations, and he'd been trying to get them to come back. And finally, God, in, in desperation and exasperation, he, he is going to allow the Assyrians to come in and overpower both Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Ultimately, Israel to the north will be totally defeated, and they will be exiled into Assyrian captivity. They will actually cease to exist. But the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, which has two tribes, uh, Benjamin and Judah, and of course the rest of the people that escaped from the exile came back to Judah and lived there. That's where the 10 tribes were. The lost 10 tribes is a myth. They're not lost. They're actually right there in the Bible. You can find them. That's a whole nother subject. But the idea is, is that God is going to allow desperate times to come upon his people so that they'll turn back to him. What he's trying to get them to see is to wake up that what they're doing is not working. You know, if what you're doing is not working, eventually you just got to admit, you know what, this is not working. And we got to try something different. And they were worshiping idols and they were committing injustice and they're violating the Ten Commandments and, and not following the Mosaic Covenant. And so now they're under destruction the, from the enemy. The enemies come in. And of course, we showed last week how now the, that's what Isaiah has been prophesying. But now he's prophesying that after the discipline, after the correction, like a parent correcting their child, God's going to turn his hand and then he's going to punish the Assyrians, the rod of his anger. He's going to now, he's going to deal with those that dealt with his people. And we can learn a lot about how God operates even today if we start studying these prophetical books and seeing how God deals with nations because we have to remember that he's dealing with nations here. He's not dealing with an individual person, he's dealing with nations. And so it kind of gives us some insight as we go through the book of Isaiah. But what's happening here is God now is beginning to compare the Assyrian king who is arrogant and haughty. He's proud. And he said in chapter 10, verses 5 through, through, five through 9, he says there that the king of Assyria, is, he's going to give the, the, the Israelites into their hand for a season, but the king of Assyria is not going to think that it's God that's allowing him to do this, but he's going to get proud. He's going to think, look what I've done. He's going to be proud and arrogant. And it's kind of like what happens with the Cowboys every time they start winning. You know, they did it the other day, and I'm like, I told Patty, would they just be quiet? They started talking about how great they were and how they're going to win the Super Bowl and how it might be the best defense ever in history of football. And I'm like, come on, guys, this is the jinx for us. Because this is what happens to the Cowboys. They win a couple games and they get proud and arrogant. I'm a Cowboys fan. I can be critical of the Cowboys, okay? So I go through this every year, okay? Every year. And then my hopes get dashed. But pride is a terrible thing unless it's when your kids, you know, if you do a good job, there's a good healthy pride. You know, there's a humble brag and that kind of thing. But, but pride and arrogance is not a good thing. And this king of Assyria is looking at his victories and he's saying to himself, look how good I am. Did any other gods of the nations stop me? No God can stop me. And well, we saw last week that he goes through a list. Isaiah says he's going to go all the way to Jerusalem in a countdown of 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. He's going to get from one city to another city till he gets closer and closer. And he's going to go right to the city of Jerusalem and he's going to shout to the city of Jerusalem, but he's never going to take it because at that point, is a turning point. God says enough is enough. And he's going to humble the Assyrians. And Isaiah chapters 37 through 39 record this story of how God will go out. Because somebody asked me, how did God do it? And I forgot to mention it last week. Well, it says in Isaiah chapter 38 that God sent an angel out. And just like the deliverance from the, the Egyptians, when God destroyed Pharaoh's army, God destroyed the Assyrian army and 180,000 soldiers perished. And then the king of Assyria went home like a dog with his tail between his legs. God humbled him. Now what we have to see as we come into chapter 11 is we have to see that there's a contrast being made here between the king of Assyria and the Assyrians in their pride 
and a future king that God is going to bring into the earth. And without that context, we really don't get the full weight of what Isaiah is saying. But in this chapter, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, Isaiah will make six predictions that we're going to go through quickly. He's going to make six predictions about this future king. Number one, he starts in verse one. He says, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And this goes to verse five. We already read that. And the branch shall grow out of his roots. I want you to notice rod and roots and branch are all Hebrew different words. He's talking about like a, like a little twig that's growing up, like a little tree that grows up. And back in my backyard, in fact, my wife and I have a backyard. We have a house on a lot. It's about a half an acre. And about a quarter of the acre is wooded. And there's all these tall pine trees, and they're like 80 feet tall. They're huge. And what I noticed when I went out to the woods about a month or two ago, as I was walking around, I began to notice all these little tiny green shoots of pine trees growing up in the, in the open areas. That's what he's describing here. And the contrast that's happening is between tall cedars or tall pine trees that are large and, and looming over everything and, and they get all the attention. Now he's talking about a king, a little tiny king that's like little tiny pine tree in the midst. That's the comparison and the contrast that you have to see in your mind as you're reading this chapter. You got the tall pines that can boast the king of Assyria that's proud and getting all these victories. And then God says, I'm going to bring forth the king. He's going to be a little rod, a little shoot. That word means like a little twig, a little small little branch, a little tree. And he's going to come from the roots. He's going to come from the stem of Jesse. That would be the, the family line of the king of David. And what he's doing is he's predicting a day where things will be good. And so there's a turning point. And he says, this king, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit. His, he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. Boy, that's a wise saying. He's not gonna judge by just what he sees. That's why I have a saying I use all the time. There's always a why behind the what. And if you're gonna judge something, you gotta figure out the why as well as the what. You really don't know what's happening until you know why. And that's what he's saying. He's not going to judge with the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears. He's not going to be unduly influenced. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Now what he's saying here is that there's a king coming that's gonna fulfill the Mosaic Covenant. There's a king, see, the, 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 the Mosaic Covenant, the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament is much misunderstood today. It was really about righteousness. It was really about justice. How do you treat people correctly? You know, the, the Jewish people in Jesus, they got it all wrong, and many, they went legalistic, and many people today get it all wrong thinking that God is an evil ogre just wanting to make a bunch of rules and regulations for us to follow, and that's not what it is at all. What God is describing in the Old Testament and what he's prescribing in the Old Testament is how we should treat one another correctly. This is the way you treat people that are human beings. This is how we treat other people as human beings, fellow human beings, fellow sons and daughters of our creator. And yet the Israelites, they forsook that covenant. And at the time of the writing of Isaiah and his preaching, they're not following anything. They're killing each other. They're robbing from each other, doing all kinds of evil and God is coming on the scene and saying, hey, I'm going to correct that. I'm going to stop that by bringing in the Assyrians. But he says, a future king's going to come. And this king, and you got to understand, read the book of 1 uh, of Kings and 2 Kings and Chronicles. There's like 40-some kings, and there's only a few good ones. You think you got bad government? Read the historical books of the Bible. You'll learn about bad government. These guys were bad. There was a couple, every once in a while, a shining star would come, and they'd be pretty good. But he's saying there's a future king coming, and he's going to be just. He's going to give people justice and righteousness. God's going to be happy, and it's going to make the people happy. He goes on to say in verse 6, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. 
Now these verses that I'm reading here are often quoted about Jesus and the millennial reign of Christ and, and discussing Revelation chapter 20, but I don't want us to get lost in this. Before we go into the New Testament, let's figure out what he's saying right now. He says, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Now what he's describing is natural enemies will be at peace. So what he's saying is this king is going to bring in righteousness, and he's also going to bring in peace. Now when you're a war-torn nation, when there's no justice and you're being oppressed, and you're having your, your land and your goods seized from you, which is what was happening in the time of Isaiah, when bad things are happening to your family, and you're talking about a king now who's going to establish justice and bring peace, that's good news, isn't it? This is really good news. Wouldn't you really like some peace? Wouldn't it be nice, there's 32 wars happening right now if we had peace in the earth? And he's saying these natural enemies, a leopard will lie down with a young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. Now I can see a little calf, you know, a little picture a little calf and a lion. Do they hang out? Do they go down to the pub and have a drink together? No, they don't do that. The lion eats the calf. He's talking about peace. He says, the young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. He's going to become a vegetarian. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. I went out and got, you know, for my grandkids for Christmas, we got them a cobra. Let them play with it. So it's in the Bible. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. I don't know about you, but I don't like snakes. I don't like snakes and spiders. Snakes, spiders, and heights are probably my three greatest fears, Jay. I, can, I don't like snakes because you never know where they are. I don't like spiders because you don't know where they are. I don't like heights because I know where I am. <laughs> I'm going to play in the vibe. They shall not hurt nor destroy him all my holy mountain. That would be Zion. That would be the, where the temple is. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The, this future king is going to bring justice. He's going to bring peace. Now what we don't know is whether Isaiah is speaking hyperbolically. That means exaggerating for effect because that's something that they did. This is poetry. And so when you read the Old Testament, you gotta be really careful of crude literalism or wooden literalism where you just take it exactly as it's saying. You gotta get the content of what he's saying. He's saying there's gonna be peace. But we'll address that in just a moment. The third thing he says he's gonna do is in verse 10. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. So the next thing he's saying is this future king is going to bring all the nations of the world into a relationship with God. Now, this is a major theme in Isaiah that often got missed in Jesus' time. They look back in the prophets, and they, they didn't see what was obvious. He will talk about these Gentiles. The Gentiles are the non-Jewish nations. And we are living in a time, and I've said it over and over again, I'll say it again today, that we are in a time where God is literally fulfilling these scriptures, and he's gathering in the nations. So when you look out at what's happening in the earth, and you look at what's happening in Israel and Hamas and all that stuff, and you look out in Ukraine, and you look at China, you know, China, big bad dog on the city block, right? China's economy is in a shambles. They're in a real problem. We got, when you start paying attention to what's happening, I don't know all that he's doing, but I can surmise that he's gathering the nations. Whatever he's doing is going to lend itself to God gathering the nations because he said he would. He said this future king would gather the nations. He goes on to say, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt and Pathros and Cush and Elam and Shinar. They're near Milton and Lewis, you know, and Rehoboth. And Elam and Shinar, these are all cities in the Middle East from Amoth and the Isles of the Sea. And he will set a banner up for the nations and he will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So the fourth thing that this king is going to do is he's gonna regather the remnant, another theme in Isaiah. 
that God's people is actually in comparison a small number of people to that of the rest of the world, but he's gonna regather them. He's gonna bring them back to God. He's going to bring them into safety and well-being. That's the fourth thing. I'm getting through this quick. Number five, also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. Together they shall plunder the people of the east, and they shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and on the people of Ammon shall obey them. Now, he's saying here that this king is going to bring unity amongst God's people so they can have victory. What's destroying America right now? What's our real problem? We're divided. We are me the people, not we the people. You don't have to read the Bible, read history. If you're an atheist today and don't believe anything I'm saying, just read history and take note of this. Nations fall when they consume one another. Nations fall when they're divided. Read Egyptian history, secular Egyptian history. Good kings would rise up, they'd have dominion, they'd have victory, they'd get divided amongst themselves, amongst their nobles, and then they'd be taken over. Over and over and over again. And we're no different. If we think in America we're any different, we're fooling ourselves. It's we the people. And what united the United States was our faith, was a Judeo-Christian ethic. Not everybody was a Christian. We're not a Christian nation, never have been where everybody was a Christian. That would be a fallacy. But we have been a nation that was founded on Judeo, biblical Judeo-Christian principles. And we've been blessed for it. I was just watching a documentary. I need to watch it again because it takes me two or three times to, to view something or read it to lock it in my memory People ask me how I remember things so well. I remember them because I go over them over and over and over and over again because I, my memory ain't working so good now that I'm over 35. <laughs> and I've eaten all that pie and stuff. One of the reasons I don't like Thanksgiving is after I eat some pie, I can't even remember my wife's name. Uh, that sugar goes to my brain. It does weird things. But what was I saying that for? <laughs> He brought unity. Unity. When you're not united as a people, we need unity. And to document, thank you, Jay. Jay's making sure she's taking all notes. <laughs> Christ is going to be the one that reunites the United States. We're not going to do this through politics. Not even prosperity is going to reunite us. We need an awakening. And I believe we're in the middle of one. We got to constantly, I have to do it too, reframe what we're experiencing. I reframe it all the time. I, I tend to be a pessimist. Anybody knows me, I, I, I can work hard, but I can see a problem in every solution. I'm a good problem sol solver, but anybody around me will know I can find a problem. I just start sniffing for one because that's what I do. I solve problems. Well, that can lead you to pessimism. You know, when things are going well, where, just something, the foot's about to fall, foot's about to drop. You know, where's it coming? but I'm reframing everything we're going through. I constantly reframe, God, what are you doing? You're gathering the nations. What are you doing? You're exalting Jesus. You're gonna make every enemy bow at his feet. That's what you're doing. That's what the Bible says. Now, I either believe that or I don't believe it. And I believe it. And I'm using it to reframe. What am I seeing in the earth? What, how do I make sense of everything? And then I go to books like Isaiah and I'm saying, Lord, what are you saying to us right now? I believe we're at a turning point. That's what I was saying last week. I felt a prophetic anointing on that word. This is a turning point for our church. This is a turning point for things in the world. Now, that doesn't mean everything's gonna get easy because if you read this, it took some time for things to work out. But there's turning points in history and in our lives. There's a turning point. And I went to, I went to a dinner last night with all my family. We're down in Del Mar, and we had a wonderful time. We're eating our second you know, helping of, of turkey and mashed potatoes and sweet potatoes and, and, and all kinds of goodies and stuff. And I was sitting there, and I'm looking at my family, and I'm realizing... Things have shifted in my life. There's been a turning point. Things are, my life is going a certain direction, and I can see it. 
And sometimes you just have to recognize that you're in a turning point. And it's not always comfortable when you're in a turning point, but we're in a turning point, and God's telling Israel here they're in a turning point, just hang on, don't give up, don't give in, don't bow, it's going to be okay because he's working world circumstances for the good of his people. Now, I don't know how he does it. And he, decide, he has decided not to tell me. I ask him all the time, Lord, why, why can't you tell me about this? Nothing. But every once in a while, he'll give me a glimpse. I get a glimpse of what he's doing, and it really excites me. But boy, I'd like to know a lot more. But the Bible tells us this king would unite north and south, and this country has been divided for 200 years. And the last thing that he says is in verse 15 through 16. Very important to get this if you're going to understand Isaiah. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt. This is Exodus language. This is like Exodus 13, 14, and 15. With his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in seven streams and make men cross dry, over dry shod, kind of like, remember, when the Israelites went through the Red Sea? There will be a highway for the remnant, there's that remnant again, of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. You have to understand typology. We covered this before. Is certain events in the past or even in the present become prophetical type of what God's gonna do in the future? Now he's looking back at the Exodus and Isaiah's prophesying a future event under this future king that's gonna be like the Exodus. It's gonna be a deliverance from bondage. And everything in this chapter is moving, and in Isaiah is moving, that God is going to deliver his people from the Assyrians. And the immediate situation is the Assyrians, but what he's also doing here is he's giving them a long-term look into the future when the Messiah, the Christ, will come and get ahead of myself, and he's going to do a deliverance of his people. But let me back up. To see this, you kind of have to read a number of commentaries, which nobody wants to do, but I got like 25 or 30 commentaries on my computer. It makes for great reading about 11 o'clock at night. Okay, get a, get a read a couple scholars, you will sleep like a baby. But when you peruse those commentaries, what you're gonna find is that this picture of a future king is too good to be true. You know what they say, it's too good to be true, right? What's it mean? It probably is. And there's no king that matches these six definitions. Now, some commentaries will say that he's speaking hyperbolically, exaggerating for effect, and that's possible. You can't throw that out. But I've done numerous studies on this in years past, and I've been studying this right now, and I'm not buying that argument. But it is possible that he's just speaking in hyperbole. But when you look at this, you, you see that Hezekiah, the one king that was a good king, Hezekiah will come after during the time of Isaiah. We're going to read about him later in the book. He was a great king. Hezekiah was a great king. He was a just king. He was a God, king that sought God. But he wasn't perfect. And though he did some great things and gave justice and righteousness to the people, and though he sought God and his direction, he did some real boneheaded stuff. And just remember, folks, this is a side note. Everybody does boneheaded stuff. Hezekiah was a great king. But you know what? One day he got proud. He got lifted up. And the Babylonians sent an emissary to him. And he started showing him his te the temple and his, his throne. And he starts bragging and boasting. And then Isaiah comes to him in chapter 38, 39. He says, dude, that was a mistake. He said, because the Babylonians are going to cap capture the Israelites. They're going to capture Judah. So he, so he doesn't fit the bill here of these six things. Because really what Isaiah is doing is he's pointing past. One of the things that we see in the book of Isaiah is that Isaiah will put a short-term prophecy and a long-term prophecy together. And one of the reasons he does that is he wants God's people to hear the short-term prophecy when God says, I'm going to do this in your life. I'm going to do this in your life. Wouldn't that be true? If God came to you today and a prophet stood up and said, tomorrow, next week, you're going to win the, the publisher's clearinghouse giveaway of $10 billion, and a check came in the mail for $10 billion. Wouldn't you trust that prophet? I'd want to get his phone number. Now, if that same prophet two weeks later says, in 20 years, you're going to lose that $10 billion, you better listen to him. 
And that's really what's happening in the book of Isaiah. He'll put a short-term prophecy. It's why, you know, Isaiah is a very difficult book to understand. And that's one of the reasons why. One reason is he makes, sometimes he makes a clear break. Sometimes he makes like a little easy break and you can miss it. Sometimes he puts a long-term, sometimes he puts a short-term. And you gotta kind of work through the math. But when you do, what you see is here, what he's talking about is long-term. He's saying, look, the Assyrians, I'm gonna deliver you from the Assyrians, which he did. I'm going to destroy the Assyrians, which he did. Within a few years of Isaiah prophesying that, all these things took place. But now he's saying, hey, Israel, you need to understand there's a future king coming. And there's only one human being that's ever fulfilled all six of these. And his name is Jesus. What you're going to find in the book of Isaiah by the time we get done, we're going, to go, we're going to come all the way back, but we're going to add these up as we go. I've never done this before, so I'm doing it with you. But there's all these pictures and portraits of what the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior would look like. In advance, God told his people what to look for. So we've seen so far in chapter 7, verse 13, that he'd be born of a virgin. We've seen in chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, that he would minister in Galilee. We've seen in chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, that he'd be the son of David. He'd be of David's line. And he would also be the son of God. There'd be something supernatural about this king. And we know that Jesus fulfilled all three of those. But now we get to see these six-fold, six things. I'm going to go through real quick. Number one, the king would bring justice. Well, I could cover a multitude of scriptures here, but I'm just going to cover one found in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. It's up on the screen. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets of the Old Testament, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all, all who believe, for there's no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified, that's cleared of guilt by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth, these are big words, we'll come back to them some other time, as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate in this present time his righteousness, that's also justice, that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. Now I could spend about three hours explaining that verse but let me tell you what it means. Christ forgave our sins and at the same time was just. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 says, Daniel prophesies 70 weeks upon the people of Israel. And seven, he actually gives a timeline of exactly when the Messiah would come. And he says in verse 24, to make reconciliation for sin and to remove transgression. In other words, in God's justice, God is not just a punisher of sin, God is a forgiver of sin. And when God's justice and righteousness come in the earth, it's not just a heavy hand of punishment, it's an extended hand of reconciliation. John 1.29, John the Baptist says of Jesus, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In other words, Jesus came to bear the sin. And there's all kinds of Old Testament imagery there that speaks of what God came to do in Christ. Jesus brought forth justice, but he also brought forth mercy. Number two, Jesus brought forth peace. Romans chapter five, verse one. The Bible tells us that we have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ, what God was doing. Remember when the angels showed up, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. What that verse is saying is that God is saying to the human race, I'm at peace, I offer you peace. Kind of like Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. You remember that Toy Story? Peace, Jesus came to bring peace between us and God and also between one another, as we'll see in a moment. Number three, Jesus brought the Gentiles to God. The whole New Testament is practically about how after Jesus went to the Jews first. And besides, there's a myth. The church didn't replace the Jews. Called replacement theology. That's, that's off-center. They got some elements of truth like every theology, but it's off-center. The church is Jewish and Gentile. Jesus didn't come to get rid of a people. He came to invite a people. 
He came to say the Jews had missed their opportunity to advance the gospel in all the world. That's why they were chosen. One of the reasons why Israel is persecuted is because they wear this label, they're chosen. Well, the good news is the Bible says you're chosen too. And whenever you're chosen, you know what it means? People go out and say, I'm chosen. People don't like that. They don't like you to brag chosen, so people get jealous. And that's all talked about in the Bible. People are jealous of Israel. Well, God came on the scene in Jesus Christ, and now he reached out and a certain amount of them received him as Messiah, but the Bible talks about in Romans how he's gonna make the rest of them jealous through Christ and the church, and that's what he's doing in the earth. Right now, he's gonna draw them back, but they're not, they've not been replaced. He's added, Jesus came, and he, went, he reached out to the Gentiles after his resurrection. In Genesis, I mean, in Acts chapter 10 and 11, the apostle Peter, they're preaching the gospel, miracles are happening, the church is growing, and what you'll find is they're only preaching to Jews because they think that Jesus is just a Jewish Messiah, and God has to give Peter a vision to get him to see, he's the leader of the church, that, hey, I wanna reach all nations because he's fulfilling Isaiah. He's fulfilling what God intended when he chose Israel to be a light to the nations. But they botched it. So Jesus came, and he's still fulfilling the very purpose for which God created the world. God is reaching out to the planet saying, I want sons and daughters. You're invited. That's what Jesus did. He fulfilled the scripture. Number four, Jesus brought and is still bringing the remnant back. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, what you'll find is when Jesus talks to his disciples, he says, now don't go to the Gentiles. He says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what Jesus did was he came to his own people first and he offered the gospel to them first, but that's not where they ended. When you read from Matthew chapter 13 on, what you're gonna find is Jesus ends up in Gentile territory and he begins to reach out and model for his disciples not to become exclusive that this is a Jewish club. He starts modeling when the girl that, the Syrophoenician woman later in Matthew, I think it's in like chapter 14 or 15, he's, he's reaching, she reaches and says, Jesus, will you heal my daughter She's sick and tormented, and Jesus ignores her. Read that story. People think Jesus is being cruel. No, Jesus is testing his faith, her faith, but more than that, he's showing his, his future apostles that, hey, you need to minister to people like this. He's in Gentile territory. Jesus is not exclusive. He's inclusive. What's exclusive is he's the only way. But everybody's invited. There is only one way to the Father. There's only one way to God. His name is Jesus. Because only Jesus fulfills what God predicted. The creator of the universe said, this is what I'm going to do. I could spend it the rest of the afternoon with you going scripture to scripture in the Old Testament showing you over and over and over again. There's no way these people knew this except God told them. And he's bringing back the remnant even now. Guys, don't get discouraged when you see the church as a remnant. There are times that God has to do some things and things seem to go backwards. But what he's really doing is he's fulfilling his purpose. Number five, he's reconciled the north and the south. He made his people united. Those that received him, he talks about unity throughout the whole New Testament. I don't even have time to go into all this stuff, but just read Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost, if we did an exegesis of that, it's a wonderful chapter when you read the history of that. What you're gonna find is that God brought Jews from every corner of the world. And when you read Acts chapter two, when the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit's poured out and the church is born, what you're gonna find is every Jew from the four corners of the earth is there and they all receive Christ and they all, or 3,000 of them receive Christ and those 3,000 received the Holy Spirit and then they went home and they began to promote the gospel wherever they went. And finally, Jesus Christ is the second exodus. Everything in the Old Testament is a picture It's a physical, this really happened. Wait till I do my next Digging Deeper. You don't want to miss my next Digging Deeper series where I'm going to show how consistent with known history the Bible really is. It'll blow you away. These things happened. Despite what the skeptics say, I'm going to show from the skeptics themselves that this stuff really happened. The Bible is accurate. It can be defended. And through a whole story, God's telling over and over again what he's doing in the earth why he's doing it, and how he's going to do it. And that's what the Exodus was about. 
When Moses went down to Egypt, God's people were physical slaves. They had been slaves for a hundred years, maybe more. There's a debate over how long. But nonetheless, they'd been slaves. And Moses goes down there, and through miracles, he delivers the whole nation of Israel from their bondage. And they had to put blood, the blood of the Passover lamb, over their doors. And that blood, when the death angel came, God said, a death angel, if you didn't have the blood on your door, you were going to die if you were firstborn. And that's the story of the Exodus, found in um, uh, Exodus 13, 14, and 15. When you read that story, it really physically, literally happened. But it was a type. It was pointing to what Jesus would do, that Jesus would die on the cross, that he's the Passover lamb, that he would bring a second Exodus, the real Exodus, and that is the deliverance from our real enemy, which is back to where we started today, sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. Not because Christ came to deliver us from the Romans. Not because he came to make America great again. Or not because he came to build back better. Church, we're getting ready to go in election season. I hate election season. Vote your conscience. Share your opinions. But no matter who wins, it's not going it's not to save America. But what I want you to see is that Isaiah in Isaiah 11 does something different than he's done before. He turns a corner, he looks down the annals of history, and he sees Jesus. He sees the Messiah and what he would do. If you're here this morning and you're preparing to go into Christmas season and you have never said yes to Jesus, this is a good time to do it. Jesus Christ was born to die. And he died in your place. He took on all your sin and all mine at the cross. He brought in justice. He brought in righteousness. He brought in peace. God is not mad at you. And if you're far from him, like the Gentiles, Jesus came to bring you back to him. He's not looking to exclude you. He's looking to invite you. And so this morning, church, as we prepare for Christmas, what I'd like to challenge us as a church to do is as we go through the holiday season, is let's keep our eyes on Jesus, the Christ child who was born. And let's not just celebrate with, I mean, I want you, I'm going to do some things about how to celebrate and do it, have a good fun, fun and a good time. But let us not lose sight of what's happening. Father, in my feeble words, I've tried to declare what your prophet has foreseen. He foresaw Jesus, and it's going to get clearer in Isaiah and clearer. He really did. He did receive the revelation of what you were going to do in the earth. Now, Lord, we're looking back on it, and it's just as relevant for us today as it was on that first Christmas. Lord, if there's somebody here that is struggling with guilt and shame and feeling like you're angry with them, my prayer is, is that they would understand when they leave this morning that this child was born to die and to remove all that. And all they have to do is ask you and you'll forgive them. And they can have a turning point in their lives just as Israel did. They can go from losing to winning. They can go from lack to having enough. They can go from turmoil to peace. Because that's what Isaiah 11 really is pointing to. Father, bless us as we come into the Christmas season. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Just a few announcements to keep you in the loop before we head out today. First, a warm welcome to any guests that are visiting with us this morning. We're glad that you're with us today. If you would just take a moment as you head out the door to stop at starting point. It's right in the back of the room. We'll give you some information, welcome you and you can be back on your way. Thank you for coming and joining us in worship today. Uh, for other Eagle's Nest events, please stop at Connections Corner. It's in the back under the big TV there in the lobby uh, for events and activities, lots of things going on here. In the spirit of doing good, we're collecting Christmas cards for local families that could use a little help this year. You'll find these large boxes decorated like Christmas presents in the lobby. You can drop your cards in there. Just write the uh, denomination of the card, $25, $2 million, 
whatever it is, on the back of the card before you drop it in, and we'll make sure that goes to families in need this season. Thank you for doing good along with us this Christmas season. You may notice we don't receive an offering here at Eagle's Nest, but instead, you can drop your gifts, tithes, or offerings in the baskets at the doors, or you can give online anytime at our website, eaglesnest.ch. I think you mostly know that. Celebrate Recovery. Did you know Celebrate Recovery meets every Tuesday night throughout the year at 6.30 p.m. in this room on the side? We got a few uh, fans. CR encourages anyone dealing with hurts, habits, hang-ups, anything like that, and we all have that stuff. Don't carry that baggage around. Join CR. You don't have to sign up. Just show up. And I want to tell you, this time of year, many of you know, this. it can be extra challenging around the holiday seasons. There is a special CR happening on Tuesday, December 19th to help us navigate the holiday landmines. There's no need to sign up. Just show up once again, Tuesday, December 19th, or any Tuesday throughout the year at 6.30. Next week, as Pastor Bob mentioned, we begin the Christmas series, Unwrapping Christmas. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have drama, special music throughout the series, leading us to Sunday Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, we'll have two very different services, one in the morning Christmas Eve at 9.30 as usual, and then we'll have a traditional Christmas Eve service at 5 p.m., for families to come in and join us. It'll be by candlelight. It'll be a beautiful service together before we go into Christmas morning. Want to make sure that parents and youth understand as well, we are on break for Eagles Nest Kids and Eagles Nest Youth for those two holidays, December 24th and December 31st, but we'll be back ready to serve you on January 7th. Plus, we're adding a water baptism to that service. If you'd like to be a part of that, please sign up. Several of our friends have already done that. And we'll also have a welcome luncheon later in January as well. I believe it's January 22nd. Can I pray for you as we prepare to close? Father, we are grateful. We're just grateful this Thanksgiving season for your son, Jesus. God, as we just learned about, you provided a way for our sin. We could exchange the stuff, the stuff that we like to do called sin that serves ourselves, that is selfish that comes from the father of lies for a life that is joined, literally joined with you. We can receive your spirit, the Holy Spirit, because of that exchange. God, we are grateful that you loved us so much that you provided a way through Jesus Christ. I pray that anyone in this room that doesn't know that will come forward today after the service to know more about Jesus. It's in your name we pray as we get prepared to go to the Christmas season, leave all that anxiety behind, and look to the one who provides peace, joy, and love this Christmas season. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.